Well, I will be coming this morning about to the uh, techniques in image processing for single particles. And as you may know, this is a very long path from 2D images to 3D volume. So in one word, uh, all it's very hard to cover in detail all this big step. So uh, well, while preparing this presentation, I must choose what to present, what to talk about. And then, I, that's why in the presentation you will not see any formula. And I choose my option to give you an overview of the current methods and techniques and steps instead of going to detail. Because anyway, in one hour, it's very hard to explain. And I prefer to point you to the sites and resources and then you can read more and then I will try to explain more or less uh, not in detail the ideas behind some of the algorithm and then this will serve you as tools to, to have in, in your pocket for, for working with your project. So these are uh, the basic steps. We start a normal project, start with a sample preparation, then you need to acquire some images. Then there is a 2D step of image processing and at the end the final goal uh, is a 3D volume, or a 3D model of or uh, object under a study. Anyway, even if the, the final goal is in 3D, the 2D part is very important because it's the, the previous step and will prepare, will fit the 3D reconstruction. So in the 2D preprocessing step, well, I, I also want to quote uh, to restrict that there are different EM modalities uh, depending on the object on their study and the imaging conditions. So depending on which of these modalities, this workflow can vary the bit of the step performs. In this case, we're going to talk about single particles. In this modality, we're assuming that we have a micrograph acquired from the microscope, that we have a individual um, particle or cold particles that are the same representation of our object probably in different view or hopefully in distributed view so we can get all the information to the posterior uh, reconstruction. There are another ones, helical, 2D crystallography or tomography. In all of them, uh, differs the way you acquire the image, you need to feel, you need to do some other processing. But today we are going to focus more on, on single, single particles. So here, remember, our problem is we have uh, acquired micrograph, from this micrograph, we have a set of particles or copies of our objects, and then from these copies, we need to extract some information to build a, a 3D model. So, if we go into this 2D preprocessing step, we, we need to start always by selecting particles. From this micrograph that contains several of them, also the number of particles yeah. depends on our sample. We can have a few hundred or even two. Uh, a thousand particles per micro depending on the object size and then after picking we, we, need, we should reprocess these particles and there is also an important step here that is alignment and classification so I will be going through this step and I will explain you more in alignment and classification I will uh, put more dedicated more time the last step that is one of the most important or Anyway, all of them are really necessary and, and important to get, take care and dedicate the, the needed time and validation. So, for particle picking, there are like two big branches of particle picking. There is a manual picking where the user needs to select every particle. This is <coughs> just an example of the particle picking interface in XMIP. There are in another package, in EMA or Spider or any whole package that want to do the whole reconstruction need to have this because this is the entry point for single particle. You need from your micrograph to extract your, your particle. In this case, in XMIP, we have it's a mixture between a manual particle and supervised. In this case, when there is supervised, sometimes the, the, uh, there are some kind of algorithm that is learning from what you are picking in different way, from the object size or in some more fancy algorithm. And there is also this uh, manual particle picking is uh, have some inconvenience. It is uh, very tedious, time consuming, you need to pick. And also 
you can say, well, I will pick better than any algorithm, but this also has the, the drawback that is biased by your, per, your perception of what you, your particles are. So you can also miss something that you cannot visually uh, assess that. And also, it is important now that it's becoming uh, increasing, that it's increasing the size of the data set that we are working to get a higher resolution and reconstruction. Uh, we need to automate this process. It's, it's mandatory because today, in current how uh, uh, the breaks are, uh, manual uh, or picking in general is, is a bottleneck. So we are now acquiring more data, more data, and this is a, a crucial step towards uh, automation and, and high resolution. So in, in order to do automatic picking, I want to <coughs> point you to a couple uh, papers. They are somehow old, but they are really interesting. There was in 2001 a really complete review of the uh, approach of automatic picking. And as I said, <coughs> even if it is uh, quite old in 2001, it, it explained very well the, the basis and different type of algorithm. And the newer ones are in somehow based on all this or a mixture or in this case, in this uh, review, they classify the, the methods in different uh, categories. The first one is template matching. This template matching, usually, the micro is filtered, and you get uh, like peaks where your particle uh, correlate better with, with the template. And then, somehow, these peaks are searched with on some threshold to, to detect this peak. And then uh, you extract your particles uh, from there. This is, we need to be very careful with template matching because uh, it can be model biased. So it depends on how you get your template, uh, what threshold you can have. There are some ways <coughs> in which you obtain your template from a previous 3D volume that is, can, can be dangerous, or some other algorithms create a template uh, in a supervised way where you are picking. It creates like an average of what you have picked from this average, it can correlate the, the whole micro. This template machine is one of the most used in different variations in the current uh, state of the, of the packages. There are some other ones that are like uh, maybe more computer science uh, theory behind that uh, edge detection, some other intensity, intensity comparison. For example, the, the edge detection have the advantage. Uh, is invariant to intensity. So if you in your micro you have different uh, areas with different indices, uh, this can avoid this problem. Uh, as a drawback, it is half the problem that cannot distinguish uh, between maybe contaminants from real particles. There are also these these two ones that are texture based that was proposed by Van Hill that performed well in some cases and in other not so well. And there are also neural networks that uh, is why you use in computer science, but it also has a, a high cost computationally. So, uh, I, in the when the computer pro, uh, power still is getting better, probably these other techniques should be explored more in different research. But there are not so much used now, not as research topic, but not in, in practical. There is another important paper in, in this topic of particle picking that it was a, an effort that was made in, in San Diego by the script, the, the brief career lab, that was like a, a benchmark of picking. And then 12 uh, pickers were uh, participants. Two of them was manual picking, two persons that were picking for, uh, the particles, and then was other 10 algorithms that were and in this benchmark, they only was classified in, in, like in two categories. Was one template matching that I was mentioning before, and the other one was in facial recognition. So you can see here, uh, for example, the Avon one, Fensek, Seaward, there are some of them based on template matching with different variations. In this paper, you, you can find more or less a, a brief explanation how they differ from each other, any of these uh, approximations in these two categories. And there are this other one that is facial recognition. In this case, each image can be characterized by some facial, maybe the, the uh, whole area or the intensity you can extract from your sheets or from your point, some facials. 
can classify them as a particle or a log particle. Just to finalize this uh, point in, in particle picking, I want to mention a more recent approach. There was also a, by Bridget Carrera in this lab a dot picker and this Till figures that are implemented in, in Apple, this is somehow also a template a matching by using some Gaussian, so it is not a, using a real template, so it, it's not a, a glob that can correlate with the, the peaks in your micro. And the deep phase picking is also for, for doing picking particles in for using random conical tilt, where you need uh, your tilted particles and also the, the tilt. A image from which you can extract the different views of, of your object. Also, in your group, next week we have a, recently, in the last year, presented a, a, ma a pattern matching approach that is also a, like a mixture between template matching and the phase. In this algorithm, uh, there is the common way of filtering the micro, detecting the peaks, and then uh, one thing that has yield very good results in terms of time and computation is that we use a support vector machine classifier that is very fast and we have like two layers. First, the particles are classified as particle or non-particles, but in the particle group sometimes there are particles that are damaged or have some problems and then there is a, another layer of classification that also discriminate this kind of particle. Also, this algorithm used for, the, for entering the classification algorithm, the facial that I was mentioning, that is a facial trying to characterize the noise or the globularity of your particles. There are some facials that uh, can really pretty detail in this. And this picker is now that the one that we are using in Xmit. And as I said, we have it like in two modes. You can be complete a bit manually picking, you can train your, this algorithm at some point with some micro and after some point you can completely let it automatically and then after that check the, the results. Suppose that you have a thousand, a hundred of micro and you train with the very few ones and then you can do it completely automatically after that. And we also, another method that we have uh, implemented that it's, complete, it's not exactly an automatic particle picking, but it's complementary that is uh, sorting the particles. Because, of course, uh, the methods for doing automatic picking are not as far from practice. Sometimes we cannot even see the particles. Well, we are asking too much for this very noisy <laughs> image for an automatic algorithm. And then, if could be good if we can automatically pick, and we have a second stage where we can evaluate how the algorithm has done. And this is the, the goal of this <coughs> second approach, that is a, a trying to get your picket particles and sort according to some statistics and some, also some facials. And in this paper, we are also doing some principal components. And then this is like a good balance, because you have an automatic algorithm that picks some particles for you. And then at the end you can evaluate and have not one by one, but after some point with some threshold, with this uh, set a score, mm -hmm. uh, you can drop some particles that are, could be junk or, or any bad particles. So just to conclude about this particle picking, I think uh, that it's important to go more and more automatic way if we <coughs> want to really go to high performance and high throughput uh, image processing so that we can in a very few time and we so get a final volume and reconstruction and I think I uh, will be more and more approach uh, with the new power that we have now there are increasing the way of GPUs the price are getting lower and I think this will open uh, new new doors uh, of research for this and uh, the last point is also we can combine these two steps. The main object is to enhance the signal even if we are dropping some, some important information because, for example, in this case you can see very somehow well the particle but there are some other kind of particle that you cannot see nothing and it's very bad for, for the algorithm to try to align and classify. So 
In this stage, we can filter somehow and get better even. For example, this in the middle, you see that is less noise than that, and of course, with less details in, in the particle itself. So, in this case, I, I'm showing you this is a Fourier top half filter that at some frequency is letting pass the, the low pass filtering and have a top half, like a Gaussian, how, uh, how to cut. In the first case, you can see that it's very blurry, and the second one is more or less. And in this one, we are letting pass a lot of, of noise. Uh, with the filter state, it's, it's just a, a, it's a pre-processing. It's not a, a final, the reconstruction should not be made from the filter or modified particles. This is just a, an intermediate state to enhance the alignment and classification. So after you have some uh, previous alignment or previous classes, you can go back and, and then do it with the, your original images. So it's like a going back and forth with this preprocessing and then using alignment and, and classification. Why, why do we need averaging? So, as you may know, uh, the images in electron microscopy are very noisy. This is something that distinguishes uh, our field of image processing from other topics in, in general in image processing, that we are dealing with very noisy images. So, from this, we, we cannot extract any uh, significant information. So, we need to take a lot of images. Now, the, the number, what is a lot, is increasing now, maybe until one million or, or maybe more. Uh, and then from this we need to average to try to, to enhance this signal. You see, if we average all these images, we get uh, some information of what the object is behind or a projection that is behind the, the object. And for averaging, uh, it comes uh, enhanced with another problem that is alignment. This is the, the same average, but now these noisy particles is the same version of the Linux penguin but it's rotated and shifted uh, from the, is, there are no center. And you see, this is the, the average image, that is nothing, and this is the standard deviation. It is very contrast with this, where we, we can extract the signal, because when we are averaging, the, the noise that is randomly distributed with some statistics, uh, we can get rid of the noise by, by averaging, by repeating, and enhancing the, the signal. So this is a very important step in order to get to pass from, from noisy images to classes with more information, to get from these classes a, a volume, an initial volume, or to extract some other features or, or information for, from our sample. So uh, for alignment, as I said before, uh, there are three, three, three parameters. We have a, a rotation angle in plane rotation, and we have a shift, a shift that can be in X coordinate and Y coordinate. And this is the main goal. It's only three parameters, but it's the main goal of our alignment, and somehow sometimes it's combined with classification also. Try to estimate for a, from a noisy set of images these three parameters that brings to a common position uh, all the images. This common position can be said that the reference or the classes. Also, this problem is complicated when we don't have only one uh, view or one projection. If we have several projections, it's somehow again like the egg and the chicken problem. No? That for aligning, we need to be sure that we are trying to align the same object and also for, for classifying, it is better if they are aligned that the algorithms can really compare where are the, the same. So in classification, now after we have uh, this alignment, alignment and classification sometimes in, in some approach are doing iteratively. We first align, then we classify, we get some reference, then we go back, try to align again with this better reference, and sometimes it's iterative. And in some other approach that I will mention here, these two problems of align and classify are a phase at the same time, in the same model, and are refined both of the problem uh, from, uh, from one shot. Uh, these are the, the algorithms that I will try to mention. The first one is multivariate data analysis, or it is also known as MSA, multivariate statistical analysis. Uh, is 
very uh, widely used in different packages. It is used in Spider from very several years ago. It is also using Magic and also with some variation in in, Iman, in the Iman package. I will also mention about the self-organizing map that is use some kind of neural networks. Also the maximum likelihood based appro base approach and also clustering, troubles clustering. And I will end with the, someone from, from Paul Pensek that is iterative, he calls Isaac, iterative stable alignment and, and clustering. So uh, in this uh, topic of multivariate data analysis, I will start by setting more or less the, the basis. We have as input a set of n, Im n images that are the same input for all of the algorithm. And then for this analysis, each image is uh, seen as a vector in a multidimensional space. So it, each pixel of the image can be set as, as a coordinate, as a point. And then imagine that we have, imagine in 2D, but uh, uh, an image can have a, a, any number of pixels, and then we treat this as a vector. And then the idea in this uh, uh, space or hyperspace is that we are going to put all the images and they will form images that are close to, to each other, <laughs> close by some measures that are different type of distance or, or a measure or similarity, and this will form some clothes. So the task for the classification algorithm is try to separate these groups that uh, represent views or different specimen or different conformation. And uh, in particular for this technique, all the images should have been aligned together. So you, for this uh, representation, the image of a vector, we need to be sure that a pixel to have the same meaning in all the, the images. So, and another problem here that is uh, the main uh, things that is trying to be addressed is that these vectors in terms of computational demands are very big. So an image can have uh, several thousand pixels and this can form a very huge vector and if we are using a very big data set we can have a large matrices that will be hard to, to compute. So the idea here is uh, also a technique that is trying to reduce the, the dimension of your problem, that is also called in, in several environment like the curse of dimensionality. Here, this problem is really big, even with the fastest computer, is uh, hard to, to approach. So <coughs> there are two techniques that are based on, on these assumptions and what they try to do is, what I say, reduce the dimensionality to a, to a lower space. So, and then for doing this, there are like two methods. One is corresponding analysis that was introduced in almost in 1970-69 in another field. And in this uh, analysis, they were trying to, to make pattern emerge from, from your data. So. Uh, the data, these uh, vectors, big vectors, are uh, represented in another base. So imagine that this cloud, we can find the directions where our data varies most. And then we take this as the first vector where, where, where we are going to represent our images. So the, the general <coughs> idea with these two methods, the principal component analysis and the corresponding analysis, is to this big matrix represent, uh, move the images from this representation to another one. This image will be a linear combination, so we are going to zoom uh, averages of different components that are called here the principal components or the uh, principal factors. And then your image you can represent with the zoom of these factors. And hopefully, if we we can, the images are well aligned and they are well classified. The first few factors are the ones that represent most the variation of your images, and the last factors are just the noise. And then we can do the, the same classification or the same analysis, even instead of representing the whole image vector with a very small vector of 10 points or, or reduced point. And the difference be between these two techniques is in, in the first one, there are like two uh, matrices. We see an image as a set 
of pixels and in the corresponding analysis there is a, a, an, an, another view that is each pixel which value it half in each image so it's like two ways of representing but the idea behind of these two methods <laughs> is this is having these big vectors uh, have a problem in algebra that is this uh, matrix extracting the the principal values of, of a linear system and then from these uh, principal factors have a set of properties that they are normal to each other and as I say, the first ones are the ones that represent most in the way that they are built the, the variations in your data. So this is an example where we have this factorial coordinate. Here I'm using the factor 1 and the factor 2 and I'm representing my images only using these two factors. And you can see here, this is uh, from the data that is in the spider web page of the tutorial and you can see here how the images are, are clustered. Uh, we have like three clusters, one here in the center and these are the, the representation of the variance of your data by each factor. You can see here that only with the first factor we, we have like 70% of, of the variation and with very few we have like 90%. This is a huge difference representing your image only with a vector of 10 or even 20 or even 100 than representing the image of a whole a vector of, of pixels. Also for this technique it's, it's important to have a, somehow a ways to, to analyze your results and see what of these factors means. These are how the factors look like uh, in, in this case. You can see that apart from the very few first ones all of the rest is much of, of the noise. So this uh, dimensional reduction is also a way that can be used for filtering because the original images can be reconstituted, can be recovered. This is somehow anal analogous with the Fourier filter, uh, Fourier transform. We, we represent our images in this new base with these factors and we can reconst reconstruct image back. And it's, it's a way of filtering because we get rid of, of this noise and it's very suited for, for the classification algorithm because they need to deal with a, a much a smaller problem. Here uh, you can see also uh, from this uh, factor how uh, the images are grouped in a dendrogram or there are clustering. I will be talking a bit more about this before. And this is also a uh, the same tree, but with the class average of, of each of them. In this case, it's like a hierarchical clustering where the leaf of the tree are images or classes. In this case, the tree is cut at some height. And then we, we can see here how the, the image are grouped and are average. So on top of the MDA, so the all of this I was explaining was trying to reduce the dimension of our problem. So after that step, we need to classify. And there are also several methods in classification. One of the most used one is k-means. It's a very basic clustering algorithm that is very fast, very well known. And it also has some problem. As you see here, the, the algorithm works very simple. So it's easy to understand. The k-means, he will try to organize your points in k cluster or k classes or groups. So he starts by picking random representatives of the class and then uh, will compute the distance uh, from each image to, to this cluster and will assign the image to the closest one. And after this is done, uh, the cluster centers of the cluster classes or represent, representative will be averaged with the images assigned to that cluster and then the center will be updated. So this is repeated uh, over and over again until you reach some stability, so until your images don't move from one cluster to another. And at the end, you will, you will have more packet cluster. So here are an examples how the algorithm is working. He grouped these points or images so even if you see points here, is the same idea that I 
told you before, the dimensionally reduction try to re reduce an image and represent it as a point. A point, well, for plotting here is only in 2D, but can be in hyper space. So we can have hyper planes that divide the, the groups. And this is an example where the k-means doesn't work uh, very well. Uh, k min has, as I say, some properties. It's uh, very simple and it's very fast to implement in the, in the computer. And <clears throat> one problem is the clusters for the building of the algorithms trying to be circular or globular, no? if you think in higher dimensional space. And another problem is the the com conversion is only to a local minimum. It is not guaranteed that we'll find the optimal uh, division, the optimal classification of, of your data. And also another important problem here is that it's very dependent on the initial uh, representative or the initial seed of the... And it's the results also vary very, uh, very much depending on the number of k. So a problem here is that sometimes when we are going to classify, we don't really know beforehand how are the number of classes that we have. So k here, we need to know for starting the k means that the number of classes that we are going to use. So it has been a lot of modification of the k means. This is an image of the Kerdenson or some cell organizing map that this algorithm uses a neural network where here are like two layers of the, of the network. In one layer as input are the raw images, the original images, and then these images are reduced also to, to a set of representatives that is the, the output network of the, of the algorithm, of the neural network. And in this one, we will see that have some rules. So for one image, when it's assigned to one of the representatives, it will also affect of the neighbors in the network. So this is a, like more like a fuzzy classification. So one image will not be like in k-means assigned just to one class. So one image will be probably assigned to one class, but will affect the neighbor of this class. This uh, algorithm is, we have been using uh, very much in also with masking some regions of your particle and try to detect the variation in, in a small region. It also has a nice properties that it varies smoothly between neighbors. So you can see sometimes a movement of very flexible areas and give you sometimes a very good or useful information about the, the transition from one class to, to another. Another approach that is also a, some kind of fuzzy classification is maximum likelihood uh, type of algorithm. This is a, a model that was introduced in the 1998 by Fred Sigur, but only was for a single reference refinement. So you have a reference and he pro proposed a model where your image was a, some variation of this reference, variation in terms of alignment, as I say, that, uh, some rotation and some uh, shift, and also a component of noise. And in this approach, also a modeling, a statistical model of the noise uh, was provided. So the, mo the noise was estimated as a Gaussian in the shift, and also a uniform variation of the rotation. And then this uh, maximum likelihood also was very robust to dealing with noise. See, these kind of fuzzy algorithms are, are very sweet, uh, better sweet to deal with local minima because one image, you are, uh, the algorithm is better prepared to get wrong. So he assigned an image, assigned uh, with quotation to some class, but this image is also contributing to other classes. So you have better chance that is in, this image can move or jump to another classes than in other classification where one image is uh, uh, assigned just to, to one of the, of the classes. And uh, this uh, model, uh, this maximum likelihood was also extended by Shores in, in our group when in, I implemented in XMIP. And then we extended to several references and was, as I say, uh, another uh, hidden variable that was introduced in this model was the class. So 
uh, from the model of SeaWorld, now another variable was to which class the image contribute more. And then uh, this was combined with an expectation maximization algorithm. And at the same time, this uh, objective function using maximum likelihood was trying to solve the problem at the same time of aligning the images and classifying at the same time. Uh, one of the, as I say here, one image we can see a uh, thing that is not assigned to only one. Uh, an average of a uh, class representatives will be an average of all the images taking into account the probability or some weight of how this image contribute to this class with some a parameter of a rotation and alignment. One of the problems of this uh, approach is that it's very time consuming so, since it need to explore the whole space of solution to, to really get the, the better probability of an image to be assigned to a class with some uh, alignment parameters and then it's, it's also it's very <coughs> time consuming. Another problem is that sometimes there is also a problem of other classification algorithm that bigger class, if a class have a lot of images inside, uh, try to attract some, some more images and then some classes uh, are to be empty. So some of the problems uh, in this approach uh, are somehow handled in this other approach that is uh, Raul's clustering or CL2D that is also implemented in, in XMIP. And in this Raul's clustering, one of the <laughs> A new thing that was introducing was that the ability to use two measures of uh, similarity between images. The most used one in the field is the cross correlation that works very well under the assumption that the, the noise is Gaussian and white noise. Uh, but there was introduced also a entropy that is another measure that is uh, also used in image processing and signal processing. In this house clustering, uh, it, it is a divisive clustering, so it starts with few classes and it is starting to divide classes, so you will have several levels of classes, it's, let's say starting by two, you can select in the implementation from the number of classes you want to start and at which one you want to end, and it starts to divide the classes. Also, it is a prevention that the small classes that is getting getting empty are deleted, are dropped, and then a new big class is divided. So with this, uh, somehow it's avoid to, to get uh, empty or hollow classes where there are no particles. In this uh, algorithm, uh, another important feature is that when we're going to assign a class, uh, an image to a class, it is not only compared with the class, uh, either by correlation or entropy. It also takes into account uh, for all other images assigned to that class. Because imagine that you have uh, an image and then you want to assign it to, you compare how this image, the distance, the measure, to class A and B. And then for class A, you get uh, 0.8 of entropy or cross correlation and you have 0 0.79 for another class so if you only take the maximum you will assign to, to the first one but maybe in this class the other images that are assigned to this class have like a 1 or 0 0.9 so this particular image with this score even if it is the the highest one is not good to assign to this class and then this is the, the rows clustering, the, the rows uh, way of assigning that also take into account the number of the other images that have been assigned to the, to the class. And this is also another way of preventing that uh, bigger classes uh, attract images. So it will attract images the, that are likely to these images uh, fit with the particles in this. So these are some comparisons of the distribution of the angular distance. Uh, one of the problems where we want to have to this class is because we have a 2D projection of our 3D model. And in theory, if we have a phantom where we control the exact projection of the volume and the exact classification of the images, we can measure how well the classification is done. And in theory, all the images assigned to, to the same 
projection direction should be very close in terms of angular projection. And this is a comparison with other methods. In theory, we should have here a delta. So all the images, so the cluster should have a, a peak you know, where all the images are very close together. And this is a comparison seeing that the CL2D give very good results in terms of the, the projection direction and all the images assigned to this. This is uh, also a Symbian virus 40, uh, the large T antigen, and these are the classes given by the ML2D, the maximum likelihood approach. And you can see that sometimes this fuzzy classification, there, uh, there is a mixture of classes. In this case, you see that this, this component have like two examers, and in this case, one of them is like a blurry here. And also in these other ones, you can see there are classes that have the same problem. This is uh, with the multi-statistical analysis in email. And then, for example, this class was uh, getting to CL2D and was classified. And this revealed us that the problem here is that image assigned to this class, uh, you have like two real class and there are two others that are more or less noise or doesn't belong to the, to the class. Also, uh, Another pressure of the CL2D is that uh, some image can be dropped. Can, uh, there are images that not necessarily need to be assigned to one class. In the maximum likelihood, for example, you, you consider all the images that contribute to all the, the class. Maybe it can be some variations, or, or if you can clean before your data, well, you can address also this, this problem. So the last uh, algorithm in this group is a uh, one uh, also recently, or like uh, I cannot remember exactly the year, but I think it's 2012, uh, published by Paul Pensek. And it's also a way of k-means algorithm, but he introduced some new concepts. Uh, these new features, from theoretical point of view, are not really complex. Are like ideas of doing the things better. He uh, develop a, a different variation of the k-means that is he called equal size k-means that try to address the same problem that we see the, the CL2D deal with that is trying to make the k-mean group equal size or at least uh, preventing from, from having these empty classes and empty, empty groups. This is one of the new things proposing Isaac in this new uh, algorithm. And other things is that uh, he tried to get a, a measure of stability of the alignment. So remember that in alignment we have very noisy images, we, we need sometimes to iterate. And so here, in, for measuring the stability, he, he does like uh, several alignments and then try to get a consensus or try to check where the alignment agree with each other until on their set certain threshold and then if it is good uh, he can proceed to the to the next step and the other uh, new thing here is the reproducibility of the several classification that is another point of, of validation so in this algorithm he he does the classification several times well i think it can be seen better here this uh, graph in the in the left you see like there are four uh, independent ranks of the algorithm, some independent ranks of the classification. And then from each classification, if you think in the classification as a grouping of images, you say in the first classification, in the class A, I have image one, two, three. Um, and then the number of the classes can, can be distinct from one classification to the another. But imagine in a perfect classification, we should could match one classification to another with 100%. So I, I, if the classification is perfect, I should be able to identify what is called, because then the number of the class or the name, the label, is just a, a label, no, nothing that, what really represents a class is the, the images that are assigned to, to that class. So if the classification is perfect, I should be able to, to match class A in the further classification to some other class B, C, or Z, in the other one. And then I can have, a, if I compare all of these or try to maximize the, the matching between classes, I can have a, or he defined like reproducibility of the classification. So this gives us a, an extra validation that 
it is the classification is not depending on the initial seats or in the initial alignment parameters so you can be like more confident uh, about this this idea uh, can also be applied uh, can also be extended to different algorithms suppose that if we get in a common framework where we get the the classification for different algorithms we can also do things like that. I, I mean that it's important to validate result of classes that will be used later to, to build our, our 3D model. And here is the, the first one that I saw that I, I said that is trying to have some measure of stability of the... So as I said here, uh, it's a very simple approach uh, and it's very easy to understand and it's built on a theory that is also being used in, in the field, uh, add more emphasis on, on validation. No? And also uh, an important point here is that since we are doing things uh, several times, it will take more computer times and we will need to have more computer resources to, to do validation. That is the price that we need to pay for, for have extra validation and extra confidence. But I think it's worth to, to take time. And so in general, I think for concluding the, the presentation, I just want to point that in any of the steps, there are not a silver bullet or a general solution for, for a problem, even for picking or alignment or classification. So I think it's, it's a good to have a, at least a basic understanding of how each of the algorithm works and sometimes we should read uh, the paper or even the manual or the documentation because uh, I think it's important that we should try with different approaches and then compare results and, and validate. So we need to be sure of our data or, or results and also because these steps uh, Imagine if this step is t uh, computer time consuming, 3D will be more than that. If we want to classify in 3D or refine, and then it is worth to take time and clean our data, clean our particles, be sure of the classes we have or the sample, and then move to the, to the next step. And uh, well, in this uh, way of validate and reproduce results, the software also plays uh, an important role. And, I think uh, we as developers, we have the, I think, the commitment of produce these tools uh, to make more easy for users uh, in general for the community to, to do this validation and this comparison and the, uh, well, this is all.